I am Flavia Beliani Zimmerman from the Australian Institute of International Affairs in Western Australia. And today, through the Center for Muslim States and Societies and with the support of the UWA um, Public Policy Institute, we have with us um, Dr. Has Delal. Uh, and Dr. Has Delal is going to be sharing some thoughts on the key drivers in radicalization and preventing violent extremism in Australia. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Delal. Thank you, it's a great pleasure, thank you very much. Dr. Delal, if you could share with us um, the key drivers to radicalization today in Australia. Look, uh, I think it's very complex and radicalization is not linear or, or straightforward. So there are multiple factors that are included in this and they, they could be political, they could be economic, uh, social, historical, family and psychological. So, uh, and all of these areas must be considered uh, in exploring any occurrence of radicalization that may lead to violent extremism. And sometimes it requires um, the convergence of all of these factors uh, to tip a person over the edge uh, or a group in embracing um, uh, violence as a solution to remedying uh, grievances or seeking to advance um, uh, some social or some political cause that they believe that they what well, they believe in um, but you know I think so coupled with that of course there are a number of push and pull factors that you know one needs to look at and obviously these were the sorts of things that we had to examine very clear, carefully in our community consultations throughout Australia in developing our prevention strategies around some of these and um, so the push and pull factors also play a very important role in propelling individuals to radicalize and and whilst you know I think if uh, push factors for young men and and young men are very complex there, there are um, they often cite motives uh, uh, of, of that uh, you know uh, that relate to feelings of injustice, or they um, are personal or local. It could be on international or even at a political level, uh, where they talk about issues of marginalisation or alienation um, uh, from societies, or feeling that there's a sense of not belonging or fitting into a community or a society, a sense of powerlessness or, or um, relating feelings of not being able to uh, change the world, uh, uh, social vulnerabilities relating to feelings of hopelessness and, and, and even low self-esteem. So these are all contributing factors. And, and, uh, but I think what's interesting is these are an individual phenomenon. And, and not necessarily a community phenomenon. And I think this is what we need to understand because each person will come from a different <coughs> perspective. Um, there are some uh, cross commonalities, but the only way you're going to deal with the issue and prevent someone going down to uh, a form of violent extremism is to be able to recognize those very early warning signs before it gets to that. Mm -hmm. And that's where the prevention strategy is coming. And the best people that are placed to do this are really those closest here is to understand that this becomes an individual phenomenon rather than a community phenomenon. And the best people that are placed to deal with these issues and to recognize those early warning signs is those closest to the individual. That could be families, peers, uh, teachers, uh, local community members and what have uh, community leaders, uh, religious leaders. So, but then I, I suppose the next step is then you've got to show people or give people the, the tools or the skills to know what to look out for. And so we felt that what was really important is to develop a, a behavioral indicator model with academics that could help uh, create a, a model, a behavioural indicator model that helps people with their understanding and changing anyone's social behaviour, particularly around their social relations, their ideological shifts or their criminal orientation, uh, to be able to uh, identify those early warning signs, whether there's change in those behaviours, but also to uh, match that with understanding the level of intensity. At what point does it become notable? At what point is it concerning? And what point um, is it attention level? We're more concerned from a community perspective at the notable and the concerning level because they're, they're early, early stages. So uh, we've developed a program based on these behavioural indicators uh, to educate family members and community members to be able to identify these early warning signs, but more importantly, what do you do with those signs once you recognise them and who do you go for support and where do you go for support? We felt that uh, the most effective way of uh, countering any form of antisocial behaviour 
uh, was to be able to ensure that you equip communities at the local level with the necessary skills and tools to be able to identify uh, stages or, or problems at a very early stage. So this is what this program does. Um, and it's been very effective simply because it's, and, and the reason why communities have adapted it uh, so readily is because, simply because of its adaptability across a whole range of antisocial behaviours. So it could be, it could identify issues of someone that's been a victim of domestic violence or, or bullying uh, or drug abuse or criminality, which may lead to many pathways. And one of those pathways could be radicalising to violent extremism. So that adaptability right across the community to, to recognise early warning signs has been something that communities have embraced, but it also has uh, involved a whole of community approach uh, to, um, you know, uh, being able to prevent forms of antisocial behaviour that may lead to violence. Thank you very much, Dr. Dalal. And if you could please uh, expand a little bit more and um, just share with us what are the next step forward regarding the preventing violent extremism? You are sharing with us that this is a very effective program, but there are other challenges in society now as um, right-wing extremism. Um, so how we are going to adapt? We have this yes. program to new challenges? This program, we have been advocating since the start of this program uh, of its adaptability because it does pick up on all forms of violent extremism. It is not, it is not country specific, politically specific or, or religiously specific. It's across the board. And you're right. I think now, uh, you know, we now need to look at um, countering violent extremism in terms of a wider narrative, to con look at the context in a much wider narrative, but we have been doing that at the community level with this program and I think our challenge is now to be able to expand this program more and more. We, we, uh, it, we've, I, I suppose what I could, can say is that um, uh, the demand of this program has required us now to develop an e-learning tool which is now we've, been, we've made it available on the website simply because families and people want to know more and more about uh, those uh, influencing factors around people uh, going down antisocial behaviour, whether it's, you know, being um, seconded or recruited by a criminal group, uh, whether it's around peer pressures, whether it's victims of, of uh, domestic violence or drug abuse, or whether it's religious or political, uh, you know, vulnerabilities being... Uh, um, uh, preyed upon by recruiters, uh, it, 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 it has a very broad reach and a wide reach. So um, that, that I think our program really addresses that wider context and, and I think that's something that we, we need to look at more and more in the future with a lot of our other prevention programs and that it's not just simply focused on a particular community because promoting social cohesion is everyone's responsibility. Thank you very much for being with us, Dr. Delal. Thank you. And please visit our website, www.internationalaffairs.org.au. Thank you.